What I'd like to do is share a little bit of background for um, Sebastio and for Leila, and then um, we can start going through some questions. But basically, you were both born in Brazil and now reside in Paris. Um, you studied economics, and Salgado, um, sorry, Sebastio began your career as a professional photographer in 1973 in Paris, and you worked with the photo agencies Sigma, Gamma, and Magnum Photos. Leila Wanik Salgado began her professional life at 17 as a primary school teacher and a piano teacher in Brazil, and you spent several years studying piano at the conservatory, and French at um, Alliance France. Thank you. I did not study French. And at the same time, you studied painting. Uh, in Paris, you studied architecture as well as urban planning, and she also worked as an urban planner for several towns in France. Uh, Leila's interest in photography began early in the 70s and grew with the years. In 1983, she changed her field, working first with Photo Review and then in 1984 with Longview. Uh, both were photography magazines. And in 1985 and 1986, she was the director of Magnum Gallery, where she organized about 20 photo exhibitions. In 1987, Leila created her own structure for the organization of photography exhibitions, as well as for the conception and design of photographic books, activities that she continues today. In 1994, Sebastião and Leila formed Amazonia's Images, an agency created exclusively for his work, and she is currently director of that agency. Sebastião has traveled to over 100 countries for his photographic projects and touring exhibitions of his work have been and continue to be presented throughout the world. Sebastio has been awarded numerous major photographic prizes in recognition of his accomplishments. He's a UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador, an honorary member of the Academy of Arts and Sciences in the United States, and Leila has produced numerous books and exhibitions dedicated to the photography of Sebastio Salgado. And in 1994, she received the publication award from the International Center of Photography in New York for the book Workers. She's designed and curated the numerous exhibitions which accompany the publication of the many books that she's worked on, organizing tours of these shows, 300 to date, to major museums and galleries throughout the world. In 2004, a new project, Genesis, was developed by the agency with the aim of depicting the unblemished face of nature and humanity. A series of photographs by Sebastio Salgado of landscapes, wildlife, and human communities who still live according to their ancestral traditions and cultures. This body of work was also created as a potential path towards humanity's rediscovery of itself in nature. In 2007, Leila conceived and designed the book Africa, published by Taschen, with an international distribution in six languages. It is a retrospective of 34 years of work by Sebastio Salgado on Africa. Together, Leila and Sebastio have worked since the 1990s on the restoration of a small part of the Atlantic forest in Brazil. And in 1998, they succeeded in making this land a nature preserve and created Instituto Terra. Its mission is reforestation, conservation, and environmental education. And Leila is the president of Institu Insti sorry, Institutio. And again, forgive my pronunciation. Um, I wanted to share their impressive life and the... Um, the accomplishments of both of our guests. And what I wanted to start with is, uh, Sebastio, you trained as an econom uh, in economy, as an economist, and you worked for the World Bank. Then you discovered photography. And as you said, you looked through a lens and ended up abandoning everything else. I'd like to start talking about what brought you to photography. First, uh, I do not work for the World Bank. I work for the International Co-op Organization, 
based in London, and we did a lot of missions together with the World Bank, with the World Bank. and we financed together projects. We was financed part of the project, the World Bank financed the other part. I had an invitation to become an economist of the World Bank, but it was in a moment uh, that photography was coming inside my life in so a so strong way that we are living in London this moment with Lelia. We hire a, a small boat in uh, Hyde Park in London. We have this small lake called Serpentine Lake. We get this boat, we stop in the middle of the lake, and four hours we discuss. I will be to walk in the World Bank, or I will go stop all this life of uh, economists and I become a photographer. And the discussion going for long, for months, till the moment that I take a decision, and I became a photographer. And uh, I started photography very late. I was doing my preparation of PhD in economics in Paris. When Lelia, doing her studies in architecture, she bought a camera for the pictures in architecture, and I discovered for the first time the photography. And from the moment, uh, from this moment, photography made a total invasion in my life. And uh, well, I get this job. I went to work in London, and uh, my place of work was few countries in Africa: it was Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, and Congo. And uh, I bring with me this camera. And when I came back to London, the pictures gave me ten times more pleasure than the economic reports that was necessary to do. <laughs> Till the moment that uh, going to the Serpentine Lake, I take a decision and become a photographer. And the world is glad that you did. So, um, Leila, you trained as a pianist, an architect, an urban planner, and you're a curator. You're both two creative individuals. How do you balance and support each other? It's very, it's very nice. You have to hold this up. To, it's very nice to walk, um, to to be able to walk together with the husband, because it's not easy, of course not, but uh, it's very nice to have the same, the same uh, goal in the life, and um, and we have, we are complementary, we don't have competence between between us. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's very nice to support the photographers. They need, they need somebody to, to support, to support them in, the, in their uh, work. Because um, to, go, uh, to go far away to do the pictures, they must have somebody to take care about the life. And, uh, and uh, I, were, I, were there, I was there. And for me, it was not a, a big problem because, uh, in a, in another way, I love, I like a lot my my um, inde independence, you know. And uh, it was very nice. We we found uh, the way to get uh, my independence, and he has his work, and um, and we there are fifty years <laughs> that we are together. Fifty three. Fifty-three. <laughs> ah, yeah, fifty-three. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, I began. I began. I always work in photography with Sebastian, even when I work in, in architecture and the urban planning. But um, I always helped him because I like photography. We discover photography together, and uh, and in a moment, it was for me. It was so, so. Um, Normal. Then I I I go inside the photographic um, uh, uh, world, and uh, I took the decision to go. And uh, but we have a, we had a f uh, um, a child. We have two sons, and the second one he has uh, the Down syndrome. And uh, when he was um, born, I must stop to work because it was very difficult. And uh, I began to work more with Sebastian in the house to uh, organize, organize the archives and um, selling pictures to the magazine. And when he, our son was a little bit better and, uh, 
and I began uh, to do one, uh, somebody, somebody uh, invited me to do a magazine, a photographic magazine. Mm -hmm. And I began to do this. I was very happy to, to work in photography. And after that, I continued to my, my career in the photography world. And the, the most, uh, I think the, 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 because I did architecture, it was very easy for me to do books. Because it's a small architecture, yeah, the book, is to organize the, the space, a small space. And uh, I began to do books with Sebastian. We did the, the, the first book, um, uh, Other Americas. And then I created my, my, my own uh, uh, business. Point, point and, uh, and I continue to work on today. This show you see here, I am the curator. And uh, and uh, the uh, sen I do the sonography of uh, also the museums, and uh, until today only Genesis we had um, 48 uh, uh, issues, Vacations. venues, Vacations. yeah, in the in the I don't know how many countries, and it's very good. Uh, I like my life. I go to the, the <laughs> museums. <laughs> I I know. Uh, Lots of people, interesting people, like here, and it's very good. <laughs> and, and just to complement, uh, to do the books, it's necessary to Laila to come to see what I, I'm doing, what I'm seeing, who is the place that I photograph. For example, for Janice, she came in majority of the trips that I did. She came not for the full time that I was there working, but she came in most of the trips every part around the world in order to understand really the full project and the, what uh, the, the full concept, uh, the, the, the planet, everything. Yeah. And I always say uh, when I go to the, the strip, Sebastian spent one month, one and a half months, I go for two weeks, maximum two weeks, and I say, because I work, I must come back. <laughs> I think one of the reasons that um, we wanted to have both of you on stage today is um, it's clear that this is a partnership and it's it's also clear that it's a relationship based on respect and that you've achieved a lot together and so I wanted um, I wanted everyone here to be able to get a sense of that as well and um, because I think it's so important to understand uh, what's been achieved by what you've done together. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about was um, the, you, you chose a very specific group of images to show us. Um, and this was all work that was done um, prior to the Genesis project. And one of the things that, um, that the workers and migrations um, and the other work that you did, you referred to the trials and tribulations of humanity. And you've spent um, three decades at least working around the world, capturing the darkest aspects of, of mankind. And in the foreword to Genesis, uh, Sebastio, you wrote that you had lost all faith in the future of humanity. And I wondered if you could elaborate on that a little bit. In reality, uh I do not choose to do these stories. Uh, you see, I, I made my studies in economy. I came from a country that was an uh, underdeveloped country. In a moment, we come to be a developing country. And we never keep to go as a developing country. With all conflicts that we can imagine, when I was a child, uh, Brazil had about 92% of its population, rural population. Today, probably have about 92% of Brazil population, urban population. So you've gone from a rural, majority rural population to a majority yes, urban Yes, but we population. can imagine the yeah. huge amount of conflicts yeah. that that create. European counts, in your country here, United States, take you 300 years, 400 years to become a urban count with 50 years. And we are a country that creates an incredible amount of conflicts, problem. Mexico here in France is exactly the same model as we lived in Brazil. And uh, we are a very young uh, uh, 
economy market account, who are very young democracy, who are very young urbanized place. And it's from there that I come, from all this conflictive uh, organization of society. I did uh, studies in economy, social studies. And uh, we we, with Lenin, we made a long time studies in Marxism. We are activists inside leftist parts. And when I went to do photography, I tried to do many kinds of photography when I was starting photography, landscape, uh, uh, nudes, sports. One day, I don't know why, I f find myself doing social photography. And these photographies that I did, I really never choose to go there specifically. It was the behavior of my life what uh, made me happy, what made me upset, what made me a uh, big wish to show nice things, to denounce things. And uh, in the end, my photography was my way of life. What I feel, what I mind, I made, I used this language that is photography to do. And uh, I say not to choose uh, to jump from one story from the other. Photograph one story, I link with another story that was linked to this and to this. In reality, I did a few stories in my life, a few long stories that took me sometimes five years, seven years, eight years to photograph, but uh, composed by a lot of small stories. And uh, you see, we saw a few pictures of the workers. When I was photographing workers, what was workers? Workers was the beginning of the call today, the globalization. We had uh, rich counts that was starting to have a kind of very sophisticated economy with a value aggregating the products much more higher than before. What they did, they started to transfer the traditional industry, the steel industry, the car industry to the south part of the planet and went to Mexico, went to Brazil, went to China, to India. And uh, in this moment, we saw that uh, a huge revolution was happening in the way to produce the planet. And we started to discuss with Lely and see this thing was going on and said, Lely, we must do a portrait of the working class. Before that working class, the traditional working class will disappear. And, uh, and this, I went for how many years later? Five, six years around the planet, photographing workers everywhere. And photographing workers, I started to see that uh, what was happening in our country created incredible urbanization. What's happening in Mexico, what's happening in India, in China. And uh, it, it started to born another project when I was finished to photograph workers. We saw that we were having a kind of complete. Uh, reorganization of the human family. And uh, we started to mind a project about migration, the abandon of the fields to under the towns, huge cities in the world that are big because the, the migration, the, the, the movements of population through the international borders. And uh, I went for seven years. I did a story about migration. You see, always one story born inside the other story. I photographed this project Genesis that is here inside this museum. And photographed this project Genesis. I work a lot with uh, the pure population in the world. We have uh, many population that live in this planet like we lived 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 years ago. And I work a lot with the Indians in Amazonia. What I'm doing now? I'm doing a big story in Amazonia. I work with Indian communities. I work with the forest. And uh, you see, my life al always was this. And things that I thought that uh, was important, uh, what my belief is, was my ideology. And it's this that I photograph. Of course, that my language is photography. I love photography. I love the light. I love the composition. When I have a camera in my eyes, and uh, I have this fabulous frame that uh, is space that I must feel, that I must organize. And uh, this language is my language. And, uh, but my ideology is my ideology. And I link all this together in the results of my life of photography.
So you talk about your love of photography, but didn't you reach a moment of um, crisis or uh, a point where both your, your physical health and your mental health were affected by your work? Yes. When I was uh, doing the, the last pictures that you saw in this project, John, that was uh, the body of works that we call Exodus, migrations in English, uh, I saw so many tough stories. Uh, for example, in Rwanda, this genocide in Rwanda was so brutal. I had the days that I saw 15, 20,000 people dying. You have no way to bury these people that uh, made a huge hole with a bulldozer, and the same bulldozer come with the blade and take 50, 100 bodies and put it there. When a, a bulldozer come and take all this body, always stay back a leg ahead. It was so violent, so brutal what I see that my body start to die. I start to die. And uh, in a month, it uh, was necessary to me to stop. I went to see a doctor in Paris. I become sick, very sick, everything. I was attacked by my own staphylococcus. And uh, I thought that was very sick. The doctor said, Sebastian, you have any disease. Your health is perfect. What happened that you are dying. You saw so many deaths. You are in the middle of so many violent things that you must stop. And I stop. And I lose the faith, real, in the the survival of the humanity. I told her that you are the most brutal species. And, uh, and for a moment, uh, I went back. And we finally went to Brazil. And that's incredible, because going uh, back to Brazil was the moment that my parents become very old. They gave us the land that I was created, the farm, that I, the, the branch that was created on it. And uh, and uh, we mined in a moment to become farmers, but the land that I received was so so destroyed. This land that one was, was a child was a paradise. We had incredible amount of rainforest. The land was a young land, a beautiful land, productive land. And uh, when we get this land, this land was a sick. I me, I was sick. And Lele had a fabulous idea, said, Sebastian, why you do not replant the rainforest that was here in this place before? You always tell me that you grow up in a paradise. Let's uh, rebuild this paradise. And we create a project. We start uh, to develop an idea to recuperate uh, ecologically this land. And it uh, was necessary to us to plant about uh, 2,500,000 trees to recuperate this land. We create a project with a very good friend that was engineering forests. And uh, for the moment we had plant, today we had plant 2,500,000 trees. Our land is completely <laughs> built. Uh, you see, as I said to you, everything in our life born from, from the life, from mm -hmm. everything that happened to us. And from built the Institute of Terra, came the idea to photograph Genesis. And Genesis born for the, the, the environmental project that we had in Brazil. You know? And the things were linked one to the other. And like this, we made a life. So, so Leila, it was your idea to recreate the forest. Was it also your hope that it would heal Sebastio as well? I mean, were you thinking about that as part of it? or? Perhaps, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, the, the, uh, my idea uh, came because the land, the land was really very degraded. It was something very horrible. Because when uh, uh, I, we always went to Brazil for Christmas to spend with the, the Sebastian's family, and uh, we went in this uh, in this uh, farm, and once my my. My father-in-law, he uh, he he organized all the the um, the roads inside the farm, and uh, the tractor put all the land beside beside the, the road. And the rain is the rain season, and the rain there it's really very very strong. And uh, the rain came, 
and all this this uh, soil came down inside inside this small river. It was all the rows. We could see the rows. It was really horrible. In this moment, I said the only thing to save this land is plant the forest. To replant the forest, it, it was here. And uh, and uh, after, of course, this forest could uh, save Sebastian also. It was very good. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and uh, we plant we plant. Uh, until today, Sebastian said uh, uh, two million and five hundred thousand plants inside this land, but we do a big work around with the other farmers to uh, to plant for them to to help them to save our our uh, their lands and also to save the water because uh, in this moment uh, we did have no more water and uh, in, in in our. Instituto Terra, it's, it's called Instituto Terra. It's no more farm. And um, we have water. And all the farmers around, when they come there to see, they want to have water also. And we help them to, to work with uh, their land. So you've created a place of learning as well yes. as growth. Yes, yes. So they understand that they can reclaim the land and how to be better stewards of their mm -hmm. own land. Um, y it became a national park? Yes, we, we applied for, for this status, and uh, we had it's a national park, yeah. But you see, what Lely is saying, that the, the our project today become probably the biggest pro environmental project in Brazil, because uh, we recuperate our land, we have the biggest nursery in all region, we produce about one million seedlings, of about 100 different species per year. We work only with native species. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we are preparing to create a new nursery to produce about 5 million seedlings per year. Because we are working the recuperation of the water of our watershed, our valley. Our valley is a huge valley. Our valley is the size of Portugal. And, uh, but, we kill all the valley. It was not the farm on my father that was destroyed. Everything was destroyed. Mm -hmm. Like here in California, always destroyed. Yeah. Ecologically, is the death here. You see, uh, you have no more water. We have no more water. It's the same. When you destroy the trees, we destroy the source of water. While working now in our project is one thing that we can apply here. We are recuperating every source of water. You see, the water don't burn in the soil. The, the soil has no water. The stone has no water. The water comes in a river, aerial river. It rains, come in the soil. If you don't have the roots of the trees, the leaves of the trees that come around, that you don't create a humid area, when the rain comes, this part of the soil stay humid because of the trees. And all this humidity, comes converge to a point and that becomes the source of the water. And if you turn around this state, you look, you know where all the source of the water were here before. If you go there, you close an area around. We plant about 400 trees to recuperate every source of water. In two, three years, the water started to come back. And it's what we are doing now in our valley. We have about uh, 370,000 sources of water to recuperate. And uh, in these 370,000 sources of water, we be plant about 150 million trees. We do this. We be not more here. We be in the next 30 years. But uh, we started the process. Now we are planting thousands of the sources of water per year. We're raising funds from everywhere around the world and we are working very hard on this. That means this is small project that we started today become a huge project. So it was during this process then in 2004 you started to think about a project called Genesis that you end up calling Genesis. And when you s originally started to think and talk about doing this, yes, sorry. Um, it was really more, at, at first you thought about documenting the abuse of the planet, and then you 
decided to really go and show the beauty of our planet. So can you talk about kind of how that process developed? Uh, you see, I thought to stop photography completely. We become a farmer, and uh, and after we started the Institute of Terra project, and uh, as Lelia said, was to recuperate the land and recuperate my health. And the land saved my life. See, come back the trees, come back the life. You see, one tree is so important. One tree is a house for thousands of animals. And uh, if you see the number of ants that there is one tree, the termites, the birds, every kind of insect, it's amazing. And when we start to replant the trees, you have a young forest, it's a baby forest, but it is a tree that give leaves, that give flowers, that the life come to it. And uh, when we saw this young forest growing, the life came back to us, but it came stronger to us. And uh, we are so enthusiastic about uh, the, the growing of this forest that came in, in us the wish to photograph again. And in this moment came the, the wish to go to the planet, see what was pristine in the planet, and uh, we started to do a research, and we discover that about 46% of the planet is exactly as the day of the beginning. And we destroy a good half of the planet, but a good half is there yet. And uh, we made a selection of the place around the world, and we went to see. I, till this moment, I had photographed just one animal, us. And it was necessary for me to photograph the others. I never had a made a picture of any kind of different animal than the humans. And was necessary to me to learn. I was afraid. And the first story we chose to do were Galapagos. I had a big admiration for Darwin. And Darwin, he finished the, the theory of the evolution of the species in Galapagos. And I get all the parts of the, he made a description in, in Galapagos, and I went for every part of Darwin went. And uh, there I meet, for the first time in my life, the other animals, and I went to photograph them. It was amazing, because it was necessary to learn how to photograph them. And in the end, it's exactly as to photograph a human being. I remember that I went for the first time to photograph one Galapagos, that's this huge tortoise that you have in Galapagos, that, you call, that they are called Galapagos. And uh, a tortoise don't go very fast, no. <laughs> but uh, if the torture moves, you cannot really concentrate in the personality, in the dignity of this torture. You see, these tortures are all the people. They they have sometimes 150 years, 200 years. I'm sure 100% that some of the tortures that I photographed, they saw Darwin, when Darwin came down to see them. <laughs> and, uh, and I came to the torture, she was moving. I crossed her, went in front, she came back. I said, my God, how I can photograph? And it was so dry that, that I put myself with my knees in the ground. In this moment, she stopped, I said, oh, but something happens. And uh, she was looking to me. She don't move more. <laughs> and uh, I put my shoulders in the ground. I started to move to her slowly. In this moment, she came to me. I said, incredible. She understands that I am uh, in the same level. My eyes in front of her eyes. I respect the territory. When she come to walk to me, I walk back a little bit and she came in front of me. She was looking to me. She was as curious as me, as I was for her. And in this moment, slowly I sit, and I start to photograph, and she posed for me. <laughs> she smiled for me. She did anything that uh, was necessary to me to do. You see, and I discover in this moment one big lie that tell me all my life long, 
understand that there was part of the only rational species in the planet. It's a huge lie. Don't believe these people. Each species is deeply rational inside the rationality of this species. And uh, from this moment, uh, I understand that to photograph a tree is necessary to ask the permission from the tree, to respect the tree, try to understand why the tree is there. Some trees that I photograph here in this country, they had 4,000 years old. I had a scientific with me that showed me, Sebastian, look, this tree was burned here 2,000 years ago. This, trous, this tree is here, suffer from huge winds. Look, was break here, break there. Fire, wind, snow, and the tree was there, fighting. Oh boy, what a dignity, this tree, what personality. You know? And from this moment, I understand that everything inside this planet is rational. Everything is alive. The only problem for our species is that we live a very short life. If it was possible to us to live 2,000 years, 5,000 years, we understand that every evolution, everything, and we understand that we are part of everything on this planet. And uh, for me, the biggest trip that I made in Genesis, I made 32 stories no? around the world during 80 years. But the biggest trip that I did was inside myself to understand all these things in the planet. And do you feel that you went along with that? <laughs> and were you able to see the changes as he was photographing that? Yes, yes. Uh, in the beginning, I was afraid also. Then Sebastian uh, go to photograph the, the planet, the, the views, the uh, animals, and the, the people. He, he photographed the people all the time. but. Um, in Galap I went to Galapagos with him, and in Galapagos I saw him very, very uh, good. Integrate. Integrate. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Integrate with uh, with uh, with the views, with the animals, and uh, and uh, it was re really very nice because uh, because of the. Um, he 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 was he was uh, integrated, but uh, how you say very relaxed? relaxed yeah. Yes, very relaxed to uh, to photograph uh, to photograph the animals and the also the views because the landscape. the landscape because landscape we need to wait wait for a, a nice uh, nice cloud nice light you know stay there and wait and. Uh, uh, Sebastian it was not uh, the, the kind of man that wait a lot. He <laughs> went and the see and did and take pictures. And then he was sit there waiting. And it was very nice. I was very, very comfortable. And uh, okay, he, he 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 can continue to do and he do, he did for seven years. <laughs> eight eight years, yes, eight years, yeah. Um so it it seems like y that maybe you've had to experience the worst of mankind to be able to move on and, and create Genesis. Um, do you feel that that's the case? What's the question? What's the question? So I guess the question is, um, you had to go on the journey that you took as a photographer and experience the worst that mankind had to offer remove yourself from that, and then that allowed the next important journey to really happen, which is Genesis. Um, less a question, more of a, a comment, I think. I, I'm not sure that Genesis would have happened if you hadn't taken the kinds of photographs that you had taken before. Do you think that's the case? Uh, you see, I don't photograph only the tough thing for the human. When, when I did walkers, Walkers, I was so proud to be part of the human kind. Mm -hmm. no? The man is so proud to produce. The man is a fabulous producer. No? The homo sapiens that went all over this planet is the same. The guys that came from Asia inside this continent 16,000 years ago, 
and disappear down in this continent. And after 500 years ago, when the Europeans arrived here, they come to meet then again. It was the same that arrived here 16,000 years ago than the, the others that come 500 years ago. They met again all together, and uh, they destroy so many in the planet, but they built so many at the same time. And when I was doing workers, I was doing the good side of the man. And uh, I tell you, I work inside the factories, I work in agriculture, in mines, everywhere, and everywhere. Every person that I photographed, they were proud to be photographed in the production. And uh, it was amazing. I remember when I went uh, to photograph uh, in the shipyard. Shipyard, for a ship, a construction of a ship for me was the resume of the production of uh, the humankind. Uh, you see, a guy go inside a coal mine, others go inside an iron ore mine. These products come to a factory. They become steel when they melt it together. They become flat steel like this table. They go to a shipyard. When you see the beginning of a ship, that's amazing that one day these things can flotate in the ocean. And the men melt one part with the other. That create a kind of shape. And they put machines inside. One day they threw this in the water. That flotate and that go travel all over the world, go linking all the planet. And you see these propellers that go down inside of the water that you never see then. They are made by bronze. Bronze is the, what is the name in English? Bronze. Huh? Bronze. Bronze. <laughs> this metal, the hard. Huh? Copper. No, 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 it's Silver, not. Copper. No, 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 no. But I remember, no problem. Sorry. It's, it's, it's color of bronze. It's bronze, bronze, bronze. Oh, and this, you see, steel. was a lesson for me. I went to do the ship breakers in Bangladesh. It's a ship that travels all over the planet, carrying everything that humankind produces. And one day the ships die. And they go to this place where they cannot, uh, they don't have steel, they must cut the ship to produce steel. And the ship become everything that the ship transported in all his life. They become knives, they become forks, they become uh, instruments of agriculture. And this propeller, they become uh, cups, they become uh, tea plots, they become uh, ornaments in the necks of the ladies. You see, we were an amazing producer, transformer. And in this moment, I was so proud to be a human being. And in a few moments, I was so disappointed to be a human being. No? And uh, you see, that is the big contradiction of our life, our species. And what is a photographer? We are a mirror of everything of our species. We are a younger profession. Photography, I don't know, has how many years? 150 years, 160 uh, years? 1839 it was invented. Yeah, so. that means it's, it's about 180 years. And uh, is an instance that disappear. Photography is going. It's going very fast. What we do today with these telephones, this thing is not more photography. <laughs> no, it's not, because photography is without photography, it's tangible. Photography, what your father, your mother made your picture when you were a kid, you put in an album, you touch it. It's a photography. And uh, photography is a memory, something that tells our memory, our history. And uh, today is no more photography. It's image is another language. It's a communication language that is made to see to each other, and after we delete this, we forget that that exists, and we go again. It's, 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 it's changing. Um, my son, our son, and Vin Vendors did a film about my life. They used the same camera that I used to photograph. 
You see, my photographic camera is not more only photographic camera. It's photographic camera and human camera. And the spirit is challenging, no? You see Peter Fetterman, that represented our work here in the United States. Peter, when he goes to a show like he was now a few weeks ago in London, last week, 10 days in London, you went also to see the, the London photo. You have there about 100, 200, 300 galleries where 90% of the work is not more photography. It's plast plastician work where the people use a support of photography that become photography because the support, not because photography, because of the spirit of photography. No? And it is it's just change, it's completely different. And this work that are there in the wall, they are made to be there. It's not a work that you made about our history of our piece, our, about our memory, about uh, uh, the creativity of our planet, of the instantaneous, no? Photography, you see, in this cross-section, in this 100 to, to 50, one over 250th of a second, you have the history of the photographer, you know the lights of the photographer. If you look very well, you know the mother, the father of the photographer, you know from where he come from, you know the story that is photography. It's fabulous a photography. It's a, it's a magician moment in photography. And what you see in the walls of these galleries, it's another story. It's another thing. You know? It's something built by hand. It's much more a plastician work than a photographic work. And the spirit is changed. You know? It's changed completely. So um, I have one final question for both of you uh, before we take questions from the audience, because I know there will be lots of questions. Um, what would you like um, viewers to take away from Genesis? Layla, what is it that you hope people will um, feel or learn or um, respond to uh, Genesis? And then the same question. I, I hope the people come to see the show. I hope they go out uh, with the impression then, uh, then so the planet and all the beautiful is this planet because in this, in this show, we have uh, so many, uh, so many uh, uh, landscapes, so many uh, uh, animals, and also people living, who live in, in the uh, really in a regional way, not in uh, in our uh, in our way in the society, in the society consumption society. Then we we live, and uh, if if uh, those people can reflect, then this this planet. We have, we still have this planet like this, and we need to protect them. We we can't uh, continue to uh, to uh, destroy everything, the forest and the small lives of uh, the small animals, you know, to in the big and the also the big animals like the whales. We are we are uh, finishing with the whales, and I think uh, we need to protect this planet. If the people goes inside the show and really go out with this, this impression, I will be very happy. <laughs> now, it's the same as Lelia said, you see, uh, what we are doing in Brazil, we are trying to recuperate part of what we destroy. I believe that we must do everywhere around the world. We must do here, we must do in France, we must do everywhere. And what Genesis is, is what Leila said, what we must uh, preserve, what we must hold together. And uh, you see, we are living yet in a certain equilibrium, same if we destroy half our planet. But if we destroy everything, we have no more equilibrium. We'd be very complicated. And Genesis represent what we must hold it together.
Um, I think we'll take some questions. And are the house lights, can they come up a little bit? And we have a microphone, so if you raise your hand, you'll get the mic. You can state your question. And we'll uh, thank you very much to Mopa and, and the Salgados for this exhibit. Uh, good evening. I'm curious, uh, was it difficult for you to separate the ideas of poverty to convey the purity that you have in your current exhibit? Thank you. I, I didn't understand what. Um, do you want to repeat that question one more time? Uh, given the, the, the images that you showed prior, oh, um, okay. was it hard for you to separate the ideas of poverty from the purity of your images that are shown in this current exhibit? So he's talking about so much of the earlier work, there was a lot of poverty. And was that easy to separate for you as you began to take this new work? Or what was the relationship for you? No, th there is no difference between one thing and another. You see, uh, we must uh, discuss, we must uh, debate a lot of different issues in this planet. We must de debate the poverty, of course, the distribution of health in this planet, the housing, the pollution, the protect what is pristine, recuperate the land, it's all the same story. It's not different one thing from the other. And um, <laughs> you see, we today live in a so-called global planet. You know? and, uh, but our planet is yet very poor in um, ideas, in border. You see, you have, uh, we thought that we are going to an incredible evolution in uh, having trades happen between countries, liberating borders, uh, integrating populations. But we are yet far away from this, you see. When we mind this, we come back with an idea that we must build a wall between Mexico and the United States. No, and uh, wow, it's not possible. We have one idea today that this country had signed an agreement uh, for the, uh, the, the global hitting that the planet is going on in a very celebrated. And it's the second uh, country that uh, do the emissions of carbon on the planet. And today, we take out discount from this agreement. And uh, you see, we must um, fight for every issue, from the poverty to the protection of the environment. There is no difference between the issues. We must be concerned for everything that happens in this planet, everything that link with our behavior. All this is our behavior. There is no difference between the poor guy that's dying by, by starvation in Ethiopia. That is a person that's here in California. We are the same animal. We have the same behavior. We have the same feelings. We have the same uh, 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 instincts. We have the same basic fundaments. The idea of solidarity, the love, uh, the idea of community. It's the same, we are the same animal, we believe in the same planet. We are all concerned all together. And these stories are completely mixed up. And then we have the same rights here and everywhere. Okay, um, I saw a hand here. You have, so when you're done there, if you could bring the mic down here. Okay. I just want to thank you for you your. Need to speak up? I'm sorry. I'd Hold like them. to thank you for your mm -hmm. magnificent um, images that are so emotionally powerful. Um, I have maybe a, a trite question to ask you. Um, the images were um, extraordinary in black and white. I'm curious about when you're happy, do you use color? <laughs> um, so. When you're happy, do you ever use color photographs? <laughs> he 
said it was a trite question. <laughs> that's, that's a funny question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, when I'm happy, I use black and white. When I'm not happy, I use black and white. <laughs> and it's the same thing. <laughs> you see, I cannot photograph in color because uh, I try to photograph in color. When I start photography, when I work in the beginning for uh, the agents, for Gamma, for same for Magnum, I photograph yet in color because mag magazines don't pay me to, was necessary to me to survive. They asked me to photograph in color, I did. But color for me was a huge uh, lose of my concentration. And uh, if I photograph some something that I have spots in red, in blue, or in green, I knew that the moment uh, to have my picture back, this spot would be so important. And sometimes that break my concentration in what I was doing, mind in what I would be having. And when I was photographing black and white, it was so easy. Because, of course, nothing is in black and white. Black and white is an abstraction. But the fact to put everything in black and white, and I transform everything in different kind of grays, but the grays. The red will become gray, the green will become gray, and I will be in peace. And in this moment, was possible to me to concentrate in dignity, in the personality of the person. And, uh, and uh, the moment that I have my picture, I went inside an abstraction and was supposed to take from inside the abstraction what was important for me. And that's the point that I love color. I have very good, we have very good friends that do nice color pictures, but I apologize for me, it was impossible. So this gentleman and then the woman over here. That's okay, go ahead. Um, because of your work, you've traveled to many lands and met many people and taken many photographs. I've read your earlier work be described as a witness to the madness of the earth. And in Genesis, I've read the series of photographs are a potential path for humanity's rediscovery of itself in nature. Mr. Salgado, would you please speak to us about the times in which your character was tested and yet the importance of highlighting the need present allowed you to continue to take the photographs you do. Translation? I'm, well, I'm trying to think about that. It's fairly complex. Um, you want to simplify that question one bit? So, um, can you speak a little bit more about the times in which you were tested? Um, no, sorry, I was trying to explain to him. Um, so, I think basically what she's asking is, can you speak a, a little bit about the times in which you personally were tested, and yet it was important to still continue to uh, present the photographs that you do and make the photographs that you do. Tested, do what mean? Uh, tested, um, challenged. You see, photography, this kind of photography that I do, because now I have so many different kinds of photography, uh, as I said a few minutes ago, is a way of life. I remember that uh, when I was photographing refugee camps with so many people dying, and I was there not know if I will photograph or put my camera beside and add some people that was dying. And I did both things. And uh, sometimes it was necessary to put the camera beside and cry because I saw so many terrible things you cannot imagine. And, uh, but yet, I was there to photograph. I'm a photographer. And uh, people sometimes came to my camera like they were come to speak in a microphone, ask me to photograph, to show their suffering, the things that was happening, in order that 
everyone in this planet and know what's going on, that we can together get a solution for something. And uh, you see, photography is very, very hard sometimes to be a photographer. You are alone. In, and you must take a decision. Sometimes people criticize because you made a picture of someone dying or some people in total d distress. And, uh, but uh, is you alone that has the right to take this decision? And you take this decision with your ethical reference. Each one has one. We are completely different, your ethic from the mind. But it's with the mind that I made intervention. With uh, my ideology, with all my heritage that's inside myself, what my mother teach me that was essential in the life. You see, in this moment there is no place for to be cynical, to be any kind of this kind of things that is not real values in the society, but it sometimes we imagine that it's some happening. And, uh, and you take your picture, or you don't take your picture. Many months in my life I do not take the picture, because uh, I thought that if the picture was not to make uh, the past that you are photographing inside his dignity, it's better not to take. You see, one of these pictures that I project here today, there is a man come with his kid in the arm. His kid is dead. This man was coming from inside Ethiopia. He was arriving in Sudan. He used so much his camera that the camera dies off. The camera was completely uh, 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 tired in the moment that it was not more possible to recuperate. And this man was this kid in the arm, dead, looking for assistance. And he was so upset. But he was not upset against no one. He came to me with this kid. And uh, he was upset with uh, the choices in the life that was offered for him. That was in one. And uh, you see, I was there to photograph, to show these things. and. Uh, it's, it's very special. Sometimes it's very special. And, uh, uh, but yet, you must take the, the picture. And sometimes, you are not allowed to take the picture. You see, I made pictures, all human beings, all my life long. I never had anyone that sued me in the law. Because, uh, I had authorization for every person that I photograph. When I had not authorization, I do not photograph. But no one writes me an authorization. You know if you can photograph or not photograph. You see, to photograph is like if I have a knife. You cannot uh, walk the left side of the knife. You cannot walk in the right side of the light. You must walk over the blade of the knife, and you cannot cut yourself. You see. You must go there. You look for a person you know if you can photograph or not photograph. It's because this that there is so few photographers. There is a lot of people with cameras in their hand, but very few photographers. Very, very few. I so, uh, but but let oh. just finish. Oh. Just one funny thing that happens with me was 1975, I was photographed the Portuguese Revolution. And I was in Lisbon, walking a street with a friend of us that was a producer in the French television. I was photographing people that was in the window, that was in the street. And when I look back, my friend was coming back to me, apologizing to people for me that I had photographed. <laughs> I said, Philippe, stop. I photographed this past because they authorized me to photograph them. You, in front of me. And, uh, you see, it's <laughs> special. Uh, you may have, <coughs> pardon me, you may have already answered my question just now, but the, my question is, um, 
when photographing people, how important is it to establish trust, a relationship, a rapport with a person? It's the most important thing. I never came to photograph uh, in a situation out of an introduction. You see, I walk in, in this border here. I had an introduction. I had a way to come to the people. Uh, I had a presentation. I arrived to the people. I explained who, we, who I was, what I was doing. From this moment, uh, you are integrated inside a group. You see, I have a friend, we had a friend, he dies now, called Henri Cartier-Bresson. was a French photographer, fabulous photographer. Henri, he photographed in the same place that I photograph all the planet. He lived in Mexico, he lived in many different countries in Africa, in China, in India, everywhere. And, uh, but, uh, he had a different concept of photography. He ha had one thing that called the de decisive moment. The decisive moment uh, is uh, he came from a very rich family in France. He came from a account where you have a very good uh, preparation, intellectual preparation, and uh, account that had a big power in the world by the language, by the military power, by the economic power, that a man come from this country with uh, the backing of Henri and being a photographer, he was really a photographer. He, you see, he come f to photograph something, something was happening, let's say something that begins here and was happening, went there, and he was so good photographer and so smart that when the phenomenon was up there, he take his picture and it was a fabulous picture. You see, my concept was completely different. Come from where I come from, with my backings, my ideology, my political uh, 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 beliefs, everything. When I had this phenomena, for me, it was necessary to be inside the phenomena, to know everyone before we start to photograph, be inside, and I will photograph. In the end, I will be doing the same picture of an uh, uh, he when I arrive there. But we come from inside the cube, and he come from outside the cube. And on to say that I spent many years to photograph. I spent many, many time with the people. I went to a train in the south of Mexico, in border with Guatemala, and I came up Mexico for days and days inside. Uh, these wagons of uh, petrol with food, any kind of thing. The guys was between inside. I was there and I knew these guys like the lines of my head. I knew the life of each one of these guys. They tell them their life, these young guys, the older guys, everyone that become my family there. And I photograph with them. I travel with them. You see, I spent many times, I'm going now, I'm photographing now a story about the Indian tribes in Amazonia. After three, four years, I'm working with these guys. I'm working now in, in, in August to spend two months with a tribe. I went inside the Oaxaca, here in Mexico. I live with the Mijis. I don't know how many times with the Mijis. In the beginning, it was very hard. They don't wish me there. They were so tough with me. And after I become part of the meetings, and after I become part of the family, and after they trust me, we become friends, and I did everything together. You see, it's to, be, to do this kind of photography, you must love to be part of a community. And in reality, it's this. Uh, if you want uh, to do human photography, you must become part of uh, the community that you are photographing. Thank you. Hello? Uh, yes. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much to you both for being here and sharing your stories today with us. 
Uh, my question is, um, you know, it was clear to me through the slides and your images and your stories today that you use the camera as a tool to better understand the world and to better understand people, humanity, and to gain empathy for all of those um, different and unique situations. What do you think is the best way for us now to educate the younger generation in the very fast society of cell phone pictures and things like that? How do we educate the younger generation to create that empathy, to understand and take the time to, to understand the world? I understand. Okay. You see. I have an answer for that too, but go ahead. Okay. Lyle <laughs> uh, and myself, we teach photography during 15 years in one school in Japan, in Tokyo. And uh, it was very nice. Now we stop because we become old. And uh, it's, it's very hard to, to walk like we walk. And plus, have a group of students. Uh, we have a huge responsibility. And now we stop. But it was very interesting to come to this school, and uh, school of photography, with a third student in front of us. But it was very easy. In a few hours, it was possible to see who really will be a photographer and the ones that uh, wish to be a photographer but never will be a photographer. Some guys that instinctively they were photographers. And for these guys that were photographers, we, in the end, we called them and said, guys, you now, you finish this school, you are good in techniques in photography, now you go back to the university. You go some students in sociology, in anthropology, in uh, geopolitics, in economy, in geography, in history. You prepare yourself to understand the society that you are part of it. And after, your photography has a meaning. You can link yourself with the historical moment that you are living because you understand the behavior of your community. And that is the teaching, if I must give uh, for a young photographer, is to prepare himself to understand the society that is part of it. You can spend the life, in the end of the life, you understand the, the society. But the universe is the concentration of our history, if, uh, the behavior of our society. If you go there, you can receive teaching that prepare you to go in front. Me, I had a big chance, Lela had a big chance to be in the university. When I made my studies of economy, I don't made economy for enterprise. I made macroeconomy, national accounts, political economy, and the macroeconomy. That things that gave me an incredible base to understand my society. And I believe that is the most important point, that you are prepared to understand what kind of behavior this animal that we are is capable to do. And from this moment, your pictures have a different meaning. And I'd like to add to that that we really believe here at the Museum of Photographic Arts that it's our job to teach visual literacy, to help people better understand the visual image, the uh, context in which you see it, the history, um, not just to be image makers, but to be able to understand the visual world that we live in today. So having an exhibition uh, such as Genesis, having um, Leila and Sebastian here to be able to talk about it, that's part of the process of, of learning that. What I'd want to do, it's been a fabulous evening. I know we could go for hours, but um, we won't. And <laughs> what I'd like to do is um, invite you to uh, take a look at the exhibition and come back when it's all fully open to the public. And also um, copies of Genesis, the book, uh, signed, are available in the museum store. So please, a round of applause for Leila and Sebastian.